All right, thanks very much. So yeah, um, I know the brochures say I was gonna talk about vivisection today, but I'm afraid that's the talk later. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk instead about living worlds, which is the idea of a game world that's more than just a game, it's actually like a, an ecosystem that's alive and why that's really hard technically and some of the stories kind of we've experienced along the way. So yeah, what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about um, a bit about Improbable and our technology, Spatial OS. Who here is familiar with maybe Spatial OS or Improbable before? Cool, so people are kind of aware. Um, and then we're gonna talk about a project we've been working on with Bossa Studios, which is a London-based uh, game studio, and a game they recently brought into early access called Worlds Adrift, which is kind of the first big game really using Spatial OS under the hood. And um, I guess this is the kind of the meaty bit at the end, which is, when you come up with cool tech, it never really survives its first production kind of uh, experience and kind of sharing a few of the stories of kind of how our technology has kind of evolved since we've started using it in anger in production with our partners and kind of also how we've changed it as a result and how subsequent people are kind of looking to use it in a slightly different way. So Improbable, um, I'm the CTO. Uh, we set things up in 2012, and uh, I was actually joking with someone yesterday. I, I have the idea every company that starts either starts trying to make a game and then pivots and makes technology, or starts trying to make technology and then pivots and makes a game. And we're the first one. <laughs> so we started off, um, Herman and I, trying to build a online game that was a truly living world. So the, the trees grew, there was an ecology, there was an economy, the entire world is fully physical. Um, tens of thousands of players inside the same environment. And we knew that we need some kind of technology to have not just a single server on the back end, but a cluster of servers on the back end cooperating together um, to simulate the same space. And turns out our game was a bad idea. The technology was a good idea. And um, that's where we are right now. And um, we turned that technology, which originally was for our kind of game, into this open games platform called Spatial OS. And it kind of consists of like three elements. It's a SDK, which interoperates with kind of a lot of existing game engines and has a low level C++ API. It has a platform, which is a fully managed cloud environment where you can use command line tools to deploy your world and, and run it and scale it. And then the kind of fun bit is the spatial OS runtime, which is this new distributed systems technology we've been working on, which allows us to stitch together lots of different computers and think of it as one big spatial simulation. So yeah, I'm just gonna spend a bit of time to talk about the runtime, because this is the fun bit. So this is a pretty traditional architecture you'll find in dedicated server games, you know, games like PUBG and Friends. Um, you have somewhere on a data center or in a public cloud, you have a virtual machine and that's running a server binary, which is just a copy of a game engine which should be running on the client, but without any uh, visual rendering. And you have clients connecting into that single VM. And this is pretty great for most kind of arena experiences um, and most kind of like sort of uh, smaller scale experiences because you're not gonna break the bounds of that single machine in terms of networking and computation. It can happily deal with kind of all the networking load of talking to all those players. It can handle the simulation of all those things. But as you want to grow either the amount of people inside your VR world, the amount of concurrence, or you want to grow the kind of amount of simulation happening on the back end, um, so adding in you know persistent NPCs, adding in an ecology, adding in something richer going on, um, or you want to increase the fidelity of the world, which is going to increase the rate of updates going down to clients. So if you want to kind of be moving into more kind of Counter-Strike territory, Overwatch territory, you need to be sending updates getting towards about 60 times a second, you're going to start to blow the bandwidth and budget of that single machine. And this is kind of where our technology comes in. So the Spatial OS runtime is essentially a clustered system which sits kind of in between the connection between game clients and game servers. And it lets a few kind of awesome things happen. So the first thing is rather than having a single dedicated server running for an instance of your game, you can actually have as many game engine instances on the server side as you want. So you can have, you know, tens, hundreds, or even thousands of game engines on the back end and other processes as well, all cooperating together to simulate the same game instance. 
And then another aspect of this is the game client, rather than connecting directly into the server, is connected into this kind of distributed cluster. And as a result of that, we can um, farm out the networking across those different machines. So you're not just having a single server kind of falling over from all the networking load. You can distribute it over you know, dozens or hundreds of machines to kind of help um, like sort of sh share the load. And it's worth saying as well, those game engines and the, the runtime kind of networking cluster are all on the same data center or cloud. So if you think about latency, the latency from the client to the data center is probably you know, 50 to 100 milliseconds. But the actual machines in this cluster here, you're talking about sub-millisecond latency to 99th percentiles. So these things can talk to each other really, really fast, and, and latency is not too much of a concern. So this is some cool, like, you know, uh, topological drawings of what we do, but as a game dev, like how do you use Spatial OS? Um, the idea is you don't think about it as loads of different computers separately. You think about with our APIs coding on a seamless world, which has no loading screens, has no boundaries. And a seamless world um, contains entities, which is pretty comparable to any existing game engine architecture. Entities can represent literally anything from your players to your creatures, a tree, a rock on the ground, inventory, whatever you want. And um, again, this is pretty unsurprising. We've designed it to be unsurprising. Um, those entities have components, and those components define different facets, different aspects of that entity, um, which kind of make it unique. So you know, a, a monster in a game might be a rigid body, which has a navigation agent. Um, if you have a player moving around, it might have a rigid body, but have a player controls component. And the bit where it gets interesting with Spatial is rather than thinking about just one server and clients connecting in, you have to think about multiple server-side workers, which may be working together um, alongside your multiple clients connected. And one of the kind of fun things we're doing is looking at all those different components all those different entities have, and we're allocating the simulation of those different entities to the appropriate workers and clients going on. So I might have a physics engine simulating all the rigid bodies in the world. I might have a navigation engine, like a pathfinding system, simulating all the kind of um, characters in the world. And then the kind of authority on player inputs and controls I would give to the appropriate client who's connecting into the world. And a really important aspect of this as well is the, the nature of these worlds are so large that usually a, a single computer would explode if you tried to send all the data into it. So um, you have to perform a technique called interest management, which is only sending the subset of the world that the client needs to see at any point in time. But we also do that technique for the server side as well. So if you wanted to simulate one million physical objects, you know, an instance of PhysX won't be able to deal with that. So we can run maybe hundreds of instances of PhysX all across the cluster and give them all subsets of the world to simulate. And you're probably thinking already there are some fun concerns when you do that. And that is correct. <laughs> it's hard. So to put this more kind of concretely in context, it's good to kind of introduce Walls Adrift, which is the game I want to kind of refer to a lot um, for the uh, duration of the talk. And it's a, I guess it's hard to describe. I wish I had Enrique here, who's actually the, the kind of creative head behind it to describe it. But it's a open world survival exploration MMO. And it's around like kind of exploring these persistent islands, um, which are fully physical, um, chopping down trees in a kind of physical fashion, like they literally fall onto the ground using full physics, um, and harvesting those resources and constructing physical ships. And it kind of feels a little bit like Kerbal Space Program in terms of your welding different panels and attaching them together. And then you fly from island to island, and there are there are thousands of islands you can go around and explore, and they're all uh, player created. And this is kind of a really good example of a game which has been using uh, Spatial OS along with Unity 3D as the um, client-side engine and also the back-end simulation uh, to make that kind of game possible. And I'll show kind of like a minute of footage just to kind of put it in context for the rest of the talk. So the entire game is this kind of living ecology of things, and the players are kind of exploring throughout it. You'll player's character controller is super physical, so you have a grapple hook which can wrap around objects. You can, you know, like sort of repel down walls. Um, you'll see here, like sort of they actually chop down the trees physically. They go ahead and kind of use that to construct a uh, ship and fly around. And um, this world is, I think, about 40 by 40 kilometers in size. So it's far beyond what a single game engine could really deal with. 
the wingsuits are pretty cool. So to go back into kind of spatial OS vocabulary, every single one of those panels and pieces attached to a ship is its own individual entity, which is persistently stored. Um, even the that picture is a has a component called has picture, and that component has the URL to the picture which has been uploaded. Um, so yeah, it's kind of putting it all in context. So if we were to actually look at it from a spatial OS perspective, um, we're really all about simulation and data. So we don't really care too much what a game looks like. That's the job of the client engine, which actually connects in and visualizes the world. So this is what a early version of Worlds Adrift looks like from our view, where every single one of those dots is an entity. And you can see the kind of clusters of white represent the different islands. The blue lines are these um, storm walls, that these kind of areas which are when you try and fly through them, um, your panels start falling off your ship and lightning starts hitting you in the face and it's a bit, it's a bit exciting. Um, and in terms of how they run the game in production, they actually have um, four shards um, across the world. So they have two in the uh, EU region and two in the US. So yeah, as I said before, it's about 40 kilometers in size. Um, but with a game world that size and with that much kind of simulation going on with thousands of different like NPCs and creatures and thousands of players in the same world, you've actually got hundreds of instances of Unity 3D running on the server side all cooperating together. So each one of those different colored dots is actually an instance of a Unity 3D dedicated server running in Linux headless mode on a uh, public cloud. And all of them are kind of overlapping and they stitch together like a patchwork quilt to form the entire simulation. And they're doing like full on um, physical simulation. So they're updating about 50 times a second, doing rigid body physics and such. So this is a good example which demonstrates the kind of uh, changing from the kind of abstract spatial OS view to what is actually a, um, a physical simulation of the world. So spatial OS itself really cares about the kind of data representation of objects. Um, this is obviously a game engine actually streaming in that data and then in instantiating that as concrete game objects in the scene graph with meshes and textures, etc. We just care about the data. So zooming in a little bit, um, even one of these single islands is actually thousands of persistent entities. So the tree is an entity. When you chop it down, it becomes sub-entities as you break it up into little logs and harvest it, each one of them completely physical. There are like eggs on the ground, which are entities which you can go ahead and harvest. And um, with a creature, if you kill a creature, its corpse is going to just lie around there until it kind of either decomposes or someone harvests it for resources. So in total, you're probably looking about one million um, 1 million entities for an entire deployment, and each one of those entities are all being simulated at all times. Another aspect is uh, worker interest regions. So, as I said before, going back to that diagram where you had all the different dots, if you zoom in, you'll find there's actually an overlap region between two workers. And that's necessary to create a seamless experience, because if you imagine, you know, if trying to have interactions on those boundaries, if you didn't have a shared area of simulation, you're not going to be able to actually resolve those interactions. So the next bit really is, you know, all this sounds really cool in theory, um, but when you actually ship a game and you start to have real users playing it and you start to actually um, use it in anger, we, we learned some pretty hard lessons along the way. And they've definitely shaped our technology for the better. And we've definitely learned some things which, you know, uh, well, it was a much harder problem than we thought, which was uh, pretty interesting. And this section is probably going to go into some concrete examples of like why that was hard and what kind of problems we hit along the way. So this is a kind of an early learning, which is uh, bringing your own tools. So from our side, you know, this is the first kind of game project we didn't have, um, got involved with. And one of the things we wanted to do to kind of help people build these massive simulations was, well, a, a game engine really struggles to deal with um, these kind of large areas of simulation. Why don't we like make our own simulation environment, which is, makes it really easy to code things like logic and AI, which operates on a kind of distributed scale, can easily work across hundreds of machines. So 
it was 2012, you know, we were young, and we decided Scala was going to be a great language for that, and the game industry was going to love Scala, and um, we built this kind of actor-based message passing environment where you could, you know, all those different AI and creatures, they could communicate through message passing, it would scale to large amounts of um, machines, and then you'd still use game engines, um, but you'd use game engines for things like physics, things like pathfinding, things which they already had systems inside to deal with. And yeah, we thought this was a, a pretty pretty great idea. Um, so to kind of go back to the original picture, the idea was you'd write code inside of the entities themselves. You still have physics engines connecting in, um, but this environment was like a first-class computing environment. So it turns out, you know, creating even like a part of a game engine is very hard and a very very you know strong thing to undertake. Um, we tried to make you know idiomatic coding environment, but really to to do that. It's more than just even the computational abstractions. It's about making like sort of that day-to-day -day iteration experience incredibly great. It's about making fantastic debugging tools, and um, we also found you know this was running inside the actual runtime um, networking system. So if you tried to breakpoint something, it would just pause the entire simulation. So if you wanted to like debug the AI of like a rock, it, the entire thing would just like grind to a halt. Um, so. You know, we had the best intentions with this. We wanted to make something which was a really great experience and like met well with our tech. But you know, we kind of got ourselves into some very deep water. And what we learned is, you know, although these game engines, you kind of have to massage them to deal with working in a massive simulation. It's actually better to use the existing tool chains of existing game engines rather than trying, you know, add in something ourselves. So right now, if you use Spatial OS, you don't have to use any kind of um, separate coding environment. You can use existing engines for both server-side and client interactions, and you can write little microservices in C++ or Java or whatever you want to go ahead and build things. We've got a little bit of a worry about fragmentation in the ecosystem because we might end up having some people wanting to use Unreal for everything, people using Unity for something, using their own proprietary engines for another thing. Um, but we think you know it's better that they have that familiarity than we kind of. Uh, mandate a layer. So another thing was, uh, this is a good example of, again, beautiful abstract technology works great and then real games come along and they, they, they ruin everything because they have like real requirements. Um, a core idea of spatial is um, every worker and every client connecting in only sees a subset of the world. Uh, but in a game like Worlds Adrift, you want to obviously only really be interacting with a few things, but you want to be able to look like 10 kilometers away and see an island in the distance and say, hey, you know what, I want to go there. And if you were to stream in every single island in a high fidelity way, it would just destroy my network, it would destroy my client's ability to render all those different game objects. So this is an example where we had to add in a kind of a, a new feature to get around this, um, which was, I guess, quite uninventively called big things far away, which is uh, still what it's called to this day. And what it is around is it's around you have your kind of very close radius of objects you stream in for like trees and rocks and things you want to interact with. But there is an additional kind of stream you get of data from Spatial OS when you connect into it, which you can parameterize for things that are like super big. So things like islands, big buildings, static objects that you can go ahead and stream in. And this kind of was a good example of something we had to add to really like sort of make the tech appropriate for the kinds of games people were making. And this is something we kind of realized, um, you know, as we're getting more and more into more high fidelity games as well, and kind of shooting games more recently. This is a really interesting aspect of, uh, you know, networking development is having a very rich vocabulary to describe interest in data. So even in something like um, Battlefield, when you like zoom in your scopes, you're actually going to be changing the a cone of interest, which is going to up the fidelity of objects within your line of sight. And that kind of rich vocabulary to express interest in data coming down from the simulation is kind of what we currently have in flight as a result. So this is really the one which keeps us up at night. Um, really, really fun challenge is like load balancing, which is really the idea of, um, you know, given a game world with millions of entities and hundreds or thousands of worker processes is working out which entity goes where, what does each worker need to see, and what does each worker need to be authoritative on so that each a single worker isn't going to fall on its face when you give it one million things to simulate. So it's this challenge of like working out you know what needs to what needs to go where. 
this is a nice little video of us doing it um, a couple of years ago. It was a kind of tech demo. So each color represents a different server process on the back end simulating the world. And the entire world itself has about one million little, little dudes running around inside of it. And it's kind of showing that as those people are moving around, they're migrating in terms of the servers they're being simulated on. And I guess another aspect of this as well is we're doing a organic load balancing algorithm where um, if an area of the world gets more dense, we can actually shrink the area of simulation. So if we do something here like, you know, break the building and all these poor little people are running out, fearful. Um, what we can do there is actually shrink this blue workers area of simulation to deal with the fact that the computation load has increased. So when we did this, we, we thought, wow, we just solved this problem now. It's absolutely great. Problem solved. Everyone is going to have a great time. Um, but we learned the realities of you know, games on tech demos. And when you build things which have you know, simple political colliders and simple behavior, when you actually take that into a real game world where you have one island which is 100 megabytes worth of like voxel data, and you have fully physical manta rays and worlds adrift smashing into each other all the time, you get unique, uh, unique failures and unique things happening. And um, we quickly learned that in terms of load balancing, a black box solution which just magically sorts things out was never really going to be able to leverage the unique aspects of each game. So specifically for Worlds Adrift, we actually developed a load balancing algorithm which understands that there are regions um, of like sort of uh, the world which players like to congregate, and that is islands. And that's something where a black box algorithm never would have really known that. Um, so we developed an algorithm for laying and distributing the work out, which um, tended to gravitate towards islands. So this is a good example of learning. Sometimes we want to almost try too hard to solve some of these problems for developers. And sometimes, even if you try and give a solution to them, you have to let people pop the hood. And you have to kind of you know, say, you know what, this default implementation is great, but step aside. I've got you know, my, own, my own implementation, which is going to be super great. And that's what we did with Balls Adrift. So this next section is interesting as well, which is persistence and evolution. And there's kind of two aspects of that. One is that you have a game world that's going to run 24 hours a day, and you're going to have to deal with a lot of kind of technical challenges there. And then there's also some developmental concerns, which is when you're trying to ship a, a game which has a persistent world, and you're going into early access, your, um, your game might you know, change drastically as you go through development. But you're going to have an actual living world, which people are connecting into. And you know, what happens if you add a new gameplay feature? How do you reconcile that with the existing simulation data you have? So this is the first thing to talk about, which is worker fault tolerance. So I talked before about all those different servers. Turns out, you know, Unity is it's like a it's a great engine for you know running things on the server side. It's pretty lightweight. But when you run 100 of them, turns out they crash more often than when you run one of them. It's maths. Um, and uh, as a result of this, we had to bake in um, fault tolerance into the really core of our system. So whenever one of these things you know, is magically going to um, you know, decide to crash because something goes wrong, rather than the data in that part of the world being lost because it was stored in memory inside of that game engine instance, Spatial OS actually has an in-memory um, data store of every single entity component in the entire world. So if one of those workers was to fail, we can actually do one of two things. Either wait until we can bring up a new worker, which is going to get given the data from our um, simulation layer and can continue running. Or other workers nearby can actually step in and kind of continue that simulation work. And as a player, um, you're connected to Spatial OS, not to that game engine directly. So all you see is a glitch in the matrix. You see a little kind of like pop as the, the physics migrates from one server to another. And kind of this problem was uh, really interesting, uh, seeing this happen even when we were doing kind of smaller scale simulations and this whole idea of like uh, 
pulling the canonical data out of the game engine. So the game engine can stream in whatever data it needs from the cluster, but if it was to fail, you can replace it. It um, lets you do some interesting things in terms of scaling. You can move around workers um, dynamically and have them just pull in whatever data they need. Um, and yes, yeah, some, there's some pretty interesting techniques we can do as a result of that. And then this is kind of another aspect, which is a data schema. And this is very different than if you're using off-the-shelf game engines like Unity and Unreal. Um, a lot of coding there is your data and your code, and your, you know, your, even within blueprints, they're kind of pretty tightly coupled together. Um, but if you're developing a game, you're going to have snapshots of your game world, which are going to maybe last for years as people kind of begin to construct things inside that game world, the game world begins to evolve. So you need a way of kind of maintaining backwards compatibility of those snapshots. So this is how in Spatial OS you define the idea of you know, flammability in your game and maybe your game's called World of Fire and it's about things which can be set on fire. It's not a game idea, I promise. Um, and we've defined the idea of a, um, you know, a boolean for on fire. But maybe we get some early access feedback, and you know what? The boolean on fire sucks. We want a richer fire experience. So we want to add in temperature uh, to, to your game. Well, with the schema language, it lets you uh, add in new properties. Um, and because of these, these numbers here, these are field IDs, um, we use a technology under the hood called Google Protocol Buffers, which is a Google serialization technology, which lets you um, deal with backwards compatible data. So this means you can actually add in this new schema field, and you can actually take a snapshot of a world which doesn't have temperature, and you can still read it and understand it. So maybe you want to take that even further, and then you know eventually you want to kind of, um, well, this is a fun one, which is backwards incompatible changes, which is you actually want to um, now, you know, I want to remove the is on fire, and I want now a state machine of, you know, whether it's not on fire, on fire, or it's charred, as in it, it can't be set on fire again. And this is an example of something which is very difficult to, to do because I'm, I'm going to load in a snapshot of something which has a is on fire property, and it's not going to have it when I load this, this version of my game. But because of these field IDs, um, we're saying that this is actually a new data type, and you'll see data type one has actually been deprecated and removed. So this is a very good technique for um, being able to kind of write code which can understand the fact that it uh, has, like, has changed over time and it can deal with different types of data. And this is a very different manner of um, coding than you'd get with traditional game engine development. This is more akin to if anyone's done any kind of web app development and you, know, you use things like Rails, having like database migrations, it's a very comparable thing to that. And even though this is um, a little bit of an idiomatic break from traditional game engine development, separating your data from your code is like incredibly important if you're going to have a game world that's going to last five to ten years because you need to be able to continue developing your gameplay behavior while still keeping around your, your simulation. So this is where it gets, this is my, my favorite bit. So this is the, the thing which kept me up at night the most, which is all the things that happen when you have a seamless game world. Um, so yeah, it turns out seamless worlds are really hard. Um, if you imagine a player logs in in Worlds Adrift, builds a ship, and then flies from one side of the world to the other, a lot of things start to go wrong. So number one, coordinate remapping. Most game engines use 32-bit coordinates, which gives you about 10 kilometers of distance before you start to lose millimeter precision. And then when you do that, things just start vibrating, people's eyes start popping out of their sockets. It's not very nice to look at. Um, and this is why you'll find a lot of games are kind of mysteriously that size, because going beyond it requires you to do more interesting techniques. So um, we solve this by we actually have a double precision um, position within Spatial OS, and then we do a remapping step where when that position goes into a game engine, it gets remapped to a floating point coordinate relative to some origin, and then periodically we recompute a new origin and literally like pull the rug out and move all the objects in a big frame um, to move them to another another area, and that's really the only way of doing it within um, with something like Unity. But it works pretty well. Um, this is also a really fun one, which is worker migration. So this is saying that um, you know, as you're flying through there, you're probably going to migrate between about a dozen different servers simulating you as you go from island to island and from area to area. 
So to go back to this kind of original example, zooming in, there are these kind of overlap regions, if you can see where the different colors are kind of overlapping. And these are the points where you'll actually move authority of your server-side simulation between different dedicated servers. And this requires a technique called co-simulation, which is having two simulations simulating the same thing at once. And game engines aren't deterministic, so that's really, really fun. Um, this is showing a video of um, us playing with a simulation reconciling system. The top and bottom um, horizontal panels are two instances of Unity doing a simulation of a pile of boxes. Green means it's authoritative, red means it's not authoritative. And just for fun, we just change authority 10 times a second just to try and cause trouble with us with our algorithms. And we actually developed some blending algorithms that let both of these things simulate the entire stack of boxes, but they blend in their truths into each other. So the, the green one is going to stream its truth to the, the red box and vice versa. So this is showing us being able to have two overlapping physics engines um, without modifying the source code of physics, able to cooperate together and simulate the same space. And the, the final thing which happens when you go really far is bridge migration. And this is very similar to when you're on a train and you're on a phone call. And as you're on that phone call, you're going to go between different cell phone towers. And you're going to have that connection handed off between those servers without really noticing anything. And we use very similar techniques, but on a game side. So although those different bubbles represent um, simulation nodes, there are actually larger squares, if you can make them out. There's about six of them. And these represent um, the different kind of uh, connection areas and different servers you can actually connect to as a client to stream in the world. And what we do is when you fly from each octant to, to another one, we're going to actually um, migrate your connection from one of those servers to another one. So you, as a client, you actually connect to two servers at the same time. And then we do some handoff algorithm. So you actually can do that without, um, without the user noticing, which is uh, pretty nice. So yeah, this is uh, probably one of the most difficult features we found, especially dealing with all the race conditions of you getting messages from two connections at the same time. Um, but now it's kind of like a solved solution we can apply to all of our different titles we're working with. So yeah, this is the biggest one. Is This is a really hard problem. Um, coordinate remapping on top of worker migration, on top of connection migration, leads to a really, really like sort of interesting pile of technical problems to solve. But when you sort them all out, um, it's actually pretty nice to work with day to day. So yeah, hopefully this gave you a bit of a sneak peek uh, kind of under the hood of some of the technical problems we've been working on to try and make these big living worlds. And you know, we're hoping now we feel we've, the technology has evolved to a state where we're, we're ready to take on new, uh, new projects, we're ready to kind of like uh, really take it in different directions with different genres of games rather than just these kind of open world exploration games. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you about any ideas you have using the technology. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Cool. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. You can all, uh, also uh, ask questions in uh, Russian. We will translate them. We're um, providing a backbone, like the uh, IT infrastructure back backbone worldwide. And I wanted to ask if um, cloud is a hard sort of a requirement mm -hmm. uh, for your tech, or you're also using dedicated or able to use dedicated servers. We're pretty much able to use dedicated servers as well. So right now, Spatial is available as a kind of open, open cloud platform where people can set up an account and use it. But we're definitely open for conversations with people with existing data centers. And even from our side as well, we're interested in kind of going down that route as well. Because what we found about the cloud, although it's a great place for kind of experimentation and for scaling things, if you get super successful, the, the baseline cost compared to data centers is, is an interesting area to investigate. And from our side as well, you know, the cloud's built for web apps. It's not built for real-time gaming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're definitely interested in kind of having those kinds of conversations. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. So I have a question about Unreal integration. Cool. You mentioned that you are able to build games for Unreal Engine. Mm -hmm. uh, Spatial OS seems mm -hmm. like an kind of ECS architecture mm -hmm. and how did you 
compare this to Unreal Old School OOP yep. approach? Can yeah, you, for sure. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, it's um, Unreal 4 has got this kind of interesting, has a traditional object-oriented inheritance architecture, and then it has an entity component system kind of crowbarred into the side as well. It's a very, a very interesting like sort of a blend. So in terms of how we do that, the first thing to say is we don't um, perfectly interoperate with the replication systems of Unreal because the replication systems of Unreal deal with a single fully authoritative server and clients connecting in, but the abstraction of Spatial OS is many worker processes on the server side with, uh, with clients connecting in. So we actually have um, separate APIs, which you can still code with Blueprints and C++, um, but they, they're, they're a different kind of paradigm to the traditional replication. So what we do is for every, um, you saw the schema language in, in, in that example, we have a code generation phase that generates um, Unreal components um, for every single one of our components. And then those components you can add into your Unreal objects. And it provides a C++ API for reading and writing data, and also a Blueprint API for you to be able to script those things up as well. So that's kind of how we, we, we work with Unreal. And then we have uh, hooks for when your client or your server you know, get given entities to simulate, they um, look up the appropriate Unreal actor and kind of instantiate it in the scene. Cool. Rob, thanks for your speech. It was very, very exciting. Three very small questions. Just first, um, uh, will this technology be open source? Second, uh, what about pay, uh, payment plans about uh, mm -hmm. beta? And the main question. I just checked the site, maybe I uh, made it bad. So uh, please tell me, uh, are there some public documentation, some math calculation for mm -hmm. specific uh, pro any protocol description? Yeah. yeah, sure. So the three questions there, um, one was about whether the technology is open source, the second one which was around the pricing model, and the third one which was around um, public documentation. So I'm going to answer them backwards because I can remember the last one more recently. Um, so you can go to spatialos.com um, or improbable.io, and you can see public documentation for Unreal, Unity, C++, C Sharp, Java. Yep, it's all, it's all there. Oh, what the, what, sorry? The I'm talking about uh, protocol documentation. Oh, the protocol. So um, in terms of the actual, the we don't really actually expose our current protocol because it's something we're actively working on. Um, the There's very low level API documentation and those API calls on the client match very directly onto the actual protocol under the hood. Um, so that's probably the best place to look at it. It's It maps almost one-to-one -to, -one to the operations we send over the network. Um, in terms of open sourcing the core technology, um, for the time being, that's not something we're looking at. But we want to open source everything else besides the core engine um, in terms of our integrations, working with people to actually improve those over time. Um, and then the final one about pricing. So the we're always kind of open for conversations in different directions. But currently, it's um, kind of a consumption-based model, just like um, other kind of platforms. So you pay for the kind of amount of client hours you have with the game world running and how many worker hours you have, which is the um, amount of kind of workers simulating and how long they're running for. So if you have a tiny world with nobody in it, you don't pay anything. Um, so it kind of scales as you scale. Cool. Hi, thank you for your presentation. The first question, uh, actually, about uh, fault tol tolerance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, the cache uh, of entities uh, are placed in the special place, mm -hmm. uh, special server, I don't know, and uh, uh, all, all the entities across all the clusters mm -hmm. uh, are saved in the special place. And what if this place uh, is crashed? Yep, good question. So um, the data in memory isn't stored within a single machine, but actually across the cluster. And to deal with the VMs of those clusters actually failing, we regularly serialize the in-memory data to disk. So we have a distributed snapshotting algorithm, which you can configure to run every five to 10 minutes. And that's going to go ahead and serialize all the objects in your scene. And then it's going to kind of zip it up and store it in a, in a, in a cloud store. So that's kind of how you deal with um, catastrophic failures. So, so the player can, uh, lose, uh, can lose the data for last uh, five minutes? So right now, that's um, with, with data stored inside of spatial, that's what tends to happen. 
what people tend to do in production right now with Worlds Adrift is they um, use an auxiliary store. So if you have very important data like player progress or microtransactions, you, you store that in a kind of traditional asset database um, for that kind of data. And you store data inside of Spatial for very, very fast moving, um, fast updating things. We're working on um, our own kind of ex um, separate data stores. So you can decide on likely a per component basis. Is this a very fast moving in memory component, which has less reliability? Or is this a very, very important um, slower moving components like inventory and that inventory you could keep in a traditional database. So that's kind of what we're experimenting with now. Okay, thank you. Oh. And the second question about uh, bridge uh, when entity come, comes from one cluster to another. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, for client is, it is the reconnect to another cluster. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm interested in how the client react, uh, reacts on uh, this reconnect, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, does it have any legs or freezes? Mm -hmm. So what we actually do is um, when, when you migrate to another connection, you don't actually send down all the data again. We keep track of exactly what we've sent that client already. So we can actually, um, I guess in some ways, the, the server hands off to the other server, um, as well as the client changing server. So. I guess I can't talk about it too much, but that's kind of roughly how it works. So from a user perspective, um, it feels like a long frame. Um, it, it's something which, it, in a real-time game, you just be, you wouldn't really particularly notice it. So, so it's not unexpected for client and for server. Um, so yeah, from a from a from a client perspective, you can. It happens probably every half an hour or so when you're playing Worlds Adrift, and it's not particularly noticeable. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Cool. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, could you please tell uh, you, you you've done so many interesting uh, things, and I'm sure you thought about the compression, about the network compression. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please tell how you solve this problem? Because uh, I assume that for many clients that running around you, even on one island, mm -hmm. it could be a lot of traffic. Yeah. I can certainly talk about compression. I guess there's like two kind of areas to think about that. Is there's compression in kind of the, the lossy sense of only making sure you need to see what you need to see. So the first thing we've been working on more recently is a, a rich query language, which is kind of like a streaming SQL style description. So you can describe for every um, for every object in the scene, which ones you want to see and what, what fidelity you want to see them um, and exactly what components you want to see. So that's kind of one aspect, although it's not like tr a compression in the traditional wire sense. Um, in terms of us sending like snapshots down the wire, we also differentiate between, um, like we're not going to send the entire entity every single time. When you update a component, you only get a diff for that component. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, like I'm not actually completely familiar with the exact techniques we use for decompression on a per component basis, but we are kind of heavily inspired by game industry best practices in, in terms of the um, like delta encoding approaches there to, to do that. And that's something we're constantly working on to improve. And do you have any numbers, like uh, amount of traffic per, let's say, thousand of moving entities around, or hundred? I think when you do that, you have to put it in context with a specific game. And we're working on a kind of canonical survival MMO um, game there. That's something which is actually wrapping up as a research project in the next like two weeks. And I'd be able to actually get back in touch with you with those numbers. OK, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, you may catch Rob in private if you have any questions left. Yep. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Rob. All right, thanks very much.
Hi, we're at 4C with another one of our speakers. Hello, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Leszek Szczepański. I'm a senior gameplay programmer at Guerrilla Games in Amsterdam. Great, uh, so tell us, let's talk games. What's your favorite video game? Uh, Neverwinter Nights. That's an awesome choice. What's the very first game you've ever played? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, uh, I had an original Nintendo, so I played like Contra or Mario. But the first game I actually remember playing well was Doom. <laughs> I was way too young to play it. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's some time ago. Uh, how did you get into the industry? Uh, actually, I was a little bit lucky. Uh, I was studying at the time, and like in between u universities, so to speak. Uh, and my sister said, hey, there's this co company doing games, would you be interested in applying? I applied, and I got a job in mobile industry. And for five years I did mobile games until I figured I'm done and started doing console games. Not bad. But uh, if you had the chance to go back to the time and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Uh, don't worry about school, just make games. <laughs> you hear that? That's what I'd want. So, um, Tell us, uh, what do you like and hate about the modern industry? Um, okay, so my perspective might be a little bit weird because a lot of people complain about the crunch, working conditions, so on and so forth. I've been really lucky where I work right now because the working conditions are really, really good. Uh, the only thing I can complain about the AAA industry is that um, even being like a in a senior position, you don't have that much control over what you're building. And you have dreams, you have things you want to build, but you're still like part of, of the process. If you're like in a 200, 300 uh, person team, you would like to make a bigger impact. On the other hand, we are building amazing things. It's wonderful to work like five or seven years on a project. And after you know, seeing all these prototypes, bugs, failed builds, and so on and so forth, see the thing on YouTube or on the disk and actually playing out uh, more than you had imagined or, or, and much more than you could have built on your own. Well, speaking of building things on your own, imagine you had full creative financial uh, freedom uh, over your own project. What would it be then? Oh, I'm a horrible nerd. So I would just create like an isometric uh, role-playing game. So, so something like Fallout or Baldur's Gate. Uh, so something like that. I'm not sure about the setting, maybe something futuristic, but like a really hardcore isometric role-playing game. That would be something I would do on my own. Uh, speaking of futuristic, where do you see the industry going in the future, like in 10 years' time? Maybe some breakthrough technology? Oh, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, we've been talking about the end of PC gaming, end of console game for years now, and it didn't happen. So I think that there will be small revolutions coming on, like new technologies, new ideas. But we will be still sort of standing on the shoulder of giants. So PlayStation will be there, Xbox will be there, Nintendo will be there, and there will be a lot of stuff, and we will continue growing. Consoles will continue growing, PC will continue growing, mobile will continue growing, and new technologies like VR, AR, or God knows what else will also continue growing. That's, I think, that's what I think, I guess, at least. Is cross-play going to become a thing, you think? Sorry? Is uh, cross-play going to become a thing? Like between different consoles? Or yes. Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, there's only benefit to that, right? And it already happened before with different, uh, different games. So I think it will happen, but it's not to up to people like me to, to make it happen. Well, uh, speaking about tech, we have VR, AR, and lots of uh, amazing stuff. Do you think uh, these new input methods will eventually replace conventional controllers or not? Uh, I definitely don't think they will replace. I think they, um, they will be their own thing in, in their own right. So people were talking about mobile replacing uh, normal games, and that didn't happen. People were talking about mobile replacing even handhelds. And yes, the handheld market is so much smaller, but it's still there. I mean, how many people bought the Switch and walk around with a Switch, right? So I think VR and AR will be just another market. More people are coming into gaming, and they want other ways to play. Yeah, definitely. We're trying to see into the future here uh, at 4C. And uh, what's your opinion on the conference so far? Uh, it's really nice. Uh, it's actually well organized. I'm, su I'm surprised that uh, uh, organizers can manage all this herd of cats, like speakers and the guests and everyone. So it's going quite well. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of talks just yet, but I looked at the talk list. It seems pretty interesting. There's definitely some knowledge which I'll be able to take out of this, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, any particular speech you're maybe looking forward to? 
Uh, to be frank, I'm so freaking out about my own talk that I haven't uh, figured out this specific one I want to see. But uh, I made like a small list. Uh, I uh, circled the, in, in our brochure. So I'll be looking into what I would really want to see. Uh, if you heard your own talk from the audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Uh, whoa, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that I'm giving all the information that I, I'm supposed to give. So I, I hope there won't be that many things unclear that will require more questions. I'll be talking a lot about component-based architecture and uh, maybe that would be useful to elaborate on that. Why Gorilla started with component-based architectures, why everybody's doing it pretty much. Uh, maybe something like this. Well, hopefully you find the needed answers and thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're here with one of our speakers. Hello, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Alex Babko, Head of Global Special Projects at Wargaming. So Alex, tell us, what have you got to show us? Well, uh, today and uh, these days uh, at 4C, uh, like the, the world's uh, best game designer, game developers are sharing their experience with everyone here at 4C. Uh, and uh, Wargaming also introduces uh, our best practices here. And uh, today we show to all the attendees uh, the, the new augmented reality experience that Wargaming has recently built. So basically we've taken the Sturm Tiger from World of Tanks to real life uh, so that more people around the world can experience it, can interact with it and that's basically what happens behind our backs. So those guys with HoloLens and with uh, the Google Tango device are seeing the future because they see the Sturm Tiger here in the uh, at the conference, uh, but uh, all people ar around them who don't take the devices, they basically can't see that, but those guys are already seeing the future. Sounds amazing, but how does it work? Uh, well, uh, technically it's a Unity-based application, but available on the Microsoft HoloLens and on Google Tango device. But from the story storytelling standpoint, uh, it's a it's part of Wargaming approach towards preserving history so that we take the, uh, the model from World of Tanks which is really unique in real world so only two Sturm Tigers left in our world but with help of augmented reality we bring it to as many people as possible so that they can uh, explore this uh, masterpiece of engineering. So basically we can relive history with this device, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. So this experience is already available uh, at the Tank Museum in Bovington as well as in the Museum of History of Great Patriotic War in Minsk. And uh, we will bring it even closer to other locations as well. Pretty cool. Uh, can we see how it works? Uh, yeah, definitely. So we can now pick up the Microsoft HoloLens uh, and see what's inside as well as maybe show to the uh, watchers some uh, Screen, screenshot from the uh, tablet where you can also experience the augmented reality. I'm standing near the Sturm Tiger, a tank that has been recreated in augmented reality. It's so near I can almost touch it, except I can because it isn't there. But uh, I can clearly see it, I can see into every little detail of it. And there's actually a guide um, telling me about the story, the history of this uh, great vehicle. I hope you can see it on the screens. This is truly amazing technology. This is the future of museums and probably a lot more. This is amazing. 